Welcome. Uh, my name's Kevin, and uh, I'm one of the founding pastors of Spark Church, along with my wife, who was just here. I think she stepped into the other room over there. I was going to introduce her. Um, Danielle and I started this church, uh, symbolically enough, 66 weeks ago. Today is week 66 of Spark, and if you know um, anything about your Bible, that's the number of books in the uh, Christian canon anyway, so it's a very symbolic time for us, so we thought that was kind of cool. Um, on behalf of the entire Spark community and for all of you who are visiting for the first time and come for the seminar, just want to say thank you so much for coming and participating in this event. Um, Spark got started a while ago um, wanting to do some very cool things like this, and uh, we're just extremely thrilled and blessed that you guys have decided to join us for today. Um, I want to share a few preliminary comments and then do a little housekeeping for us uh, before we invite Dr. Wallace to the stage. Um, the first is this. Uh, we are having today what we're calling a learning seminar during what is normally a normal service time. Spark Church meets here at Etz Chaim every Sunday at 4.30. And it's quite fitting uh, for us that this is a time of learning and education because we actually believe that learning and education is actually a form of worship. And so we'll, while we're holding this uh, seminar during our normal service times, it makes perfect sense for us, at least in this concept and idea. While the word worship is most often used for music and singing, we understand worship, that which we find valuable and worthy to be not only music, but study as well. In fact, in the Jewish tradition, it's been said that study is actually the highest form of worship. So in accordance with this, we still consider your participation in this event to be a worship service. And those of you who are followers of Jesus, we invite you to participate with that heart and spirit. Second, why does Spark do learning seminars? Um, the three previous seminars that we've done are available online at our website. Not only do we believe that learning and education is crucially important to the life of the church, but we also believe that the two worlds, the world of academia and scholarship, as well as the world of church life and ministry, they actually need each other. Each world, breathes a refreshing life into the other, um, ensuring that we do not become so spiritually and emotionally esoteric that we lose our minds, um, but neither that we become so bookish and intellectual that we forget to experience and express the fullness of God in this world. Either extreme is an exercise in, in becoming so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. So we really believe that good scholarship and good intellectual rigor Thoughtful engagement should and can play a part of the church just as much as good music, prayer, sacraments, and sermons. And we are humbled and blessed that speakers like Dr. Wallace have contributed to this end. The third preliminary comment I wanted to share is that we recognize in this room that there are people from a variety of backgrounds, uh, from the most skeptical to the most devout, and we just want to public, publicly acknowledge your presence and welcome you to this event. And as a pastor, as pastors of this church, we hope that wherever you are on your journey, you feel completely at home. You feel absolutely welcome wherever you are in your spiritual and intellectual journey. Um, and at the very least, we hope that uh, an event like this together sparks <laughs> new thoughts, conversations, and questions. So thank you so much for coming and participating in this event. So let me uh, pray for us as um, we get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for everybody that's gathered into this place and for Dr. Wallace's willingness and kindness in coming and sharing. As we enter into this worship service with our hearts and our minds, God, illuminate for us new things, stretch not only our hearts but also our minds, and allow us, God, um, with an open soul to receive what you would have to teach to us. Um, God, if there's some things that we um, learn today that are challenging, I pray that we would receive it fully and completely and that we would not be fearful of anything. And if there's some things that we're overly excited, may we remember uh, to give you glory and honor in all things. And we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Dr. Daniel B. Wallace is a professor of New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary and the founder and executive director of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. The CSNTM is an institute whose, uh, whose initial purpose is to preserve scripture by taking digital photographs of all known Greek New Testament manuscripts. He holds a Bachelor of Arts from Biola University, a Master's of Theology, and PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary. 
He has written, edited, or otherwise contributed to more than 20 books. Of those books, oh, yeah, his work, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, is used in two-thirds of the biblical Greek classrooms across the country, including Yale and Princeton. He is, the, he is also the senior editor of the Net Bible, the world's first biblical translation to be tested on the internet with over 61,000 footnotes. He even has his own Wikipedia page, so that's something there. <laughs> More importantly, perhaps, is that Dr. Wallace is a fourth generation Californian and former surfer. We are deeply great, <laughs> we got a couple of applause on that one, thanks Steve. <laughs> we are deeply grateful and honored to have you here, Dr. Wallace, to address the question, is what we have now what they wrote then? Please welcome Dr. Daniel B. Wallace. Well, it's, uh, it's great to be back in California. The surf in Dallas is lousy. <laughs> I understand that uh, it's not great here except at Mavericks. How far away is Mavericks from here? 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Oh, I, I need to move here. Uh, Kevin has pursued me for some time to come and speak uh, at Sparks Church, and I'm delighted to be here. I'm always delighted to come back uh, to my home state. I have been transplanted against my will to Dallas, Texas, and uh, uh, this is still home to me, but if I retire here, it will only be after my wife divorces me because she wants to move to Washington when I retire. So we got a little bit of an in-house squabble right now. What I'm going to talk to you about is what we have now, what they wrote then, dealing with the New Testament text. By way of introduction, I want to tell you about the importance of this along the lines of a young man by the name of Brother Andrew. He was in uh, medieval England studying at what was the equivalent of a, a seminary back then at uh, uh, a scriptorium. And when he got uh, finished with his education, he was sent to a monastery where he would be uh, working as a monk. And the head of the uh, scriptorium wrote a note for Brother Andrew, and it was a, a sealed note. He was not to open it. He was to, supposed to bring it to uh, this monastery where the abbot would open it. And the abbot opened this letter, and it said, uh, Brother Andrew is a particularly anal fellow. Uh, can I say that here? Is that all right? You just did. I, uh, okay, I guess I just did, yeah. So uh, I, I'm not so sure he said it a thousand years ago, but, you know, the equivalent. And uh, so he said uh, he's well suited for uh, other than teamwork. In other words, he's kind of a curmudgeon, not a great personality, you know. And he's the kind of a guy who's very, very detailed. I think the best task you can put him to is to be writing out, copying out ancient documents of your monastery. So Brother Andrew was set to work that day. And the abbot said, uh, Brother Andrew, I want you to start copying out the bylaws of this monastery that have been in place for several hundred years. So he started copying them out. And about 45 minutes later, he knocks on the door of the abbot's office and he says, uh, Holy Father, uh, there seems to be a discrepancy between these manuscripts. Have you got some older ones I can look at? So the abbot uh, says, yes, we do have some older ones. Normally we don't let uh, a, a, a new person here, a new monk here, look at these on the very first day. But my understanding is you're pretty careful with uh, ancient documents, so I'll let you take a look. So about an hour and a half later, another knock on the door. It was Brother Andrew again. Holy Father, there still continue to be some discrepancies. Have you got anything older than this? And he was thinking to himself, my, this guy really is anal. And so the abbot sized him up and he said, you know, I've never let any of the monks here see the original documents of this monastery, but I'm gonna let you see those today. So he went down this labyrinthian path into a subterranean library and into a vault behind a vault and put him in this room with the original documents that nobody had seen in hundreds of years. And it wasn't 20 minutes before there were all sorts of knocks on the abbot's door. It was all of the other monks at the monastery. And uh, he opens the door and these guys are uh, screaming at him. He says, that new monk has gone berserk. We need to get some help for him. And so everybody runs down to the, to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the bowels of the library and finds Andrew on his desk weeping and pounding his fist. And the abbot says, young man, what's the matter? They left out a letter. What? They left out the letter R. And he thought, oh my gosh, this guy's really, really anal. 
And he said, the word is supposed to be celebrate. <laughs> you guys seem to get it first. <laughs> then just down this one row, they got it. And then over here, and then you guys got it last. I don't know what's wrong with you people. That's the uh, science of texture criticism, dealing with minutiae like the letter R, but sometimes it can play a pretty big role. That's the discipline that I've been involved in for my uh, entire career. So it's important for us to know not just uh, do we have the original text in big ways, but also do we have the original text in small ways, and I'm going to try to illustrate this as best I can with you. But for those of you who are believers in Jesus Christ, you want to know that the Bible you have in your hands at least goes back to the original text to some degree. And those of you who are skeptical would also like to know whether it does or not, although uh, you're probably predisposed to think that it probably does not. So let me begin by quoting from that great scholar, Dan Brown, in his book, The Da Vinci Code. No, I'm not going to use straw man. Well, this is a straw man, but uh, I'll get into some real people here too. But he has Sir Lee Teabing say, the Bible has evolved through countless translations, additions, and revisions. History has never had a definitive version of the book. Well, we've all heard that kind of thing. Many of us have probably said it. Hasn't the Bible been translated and retranslated so many times we can't possibly tell what it originally said? Well, that's one of the questions we're going to be wrestling with tonight. Let me quote from another fellow who's a little bit more... Um, uh, qualified, I suppose, C.J. Werleman, who is an atheist, uh, he likes to give provocative titles to his books, so this one is called Jesus Lied. His first book was God Hates You, Hate Him Back. Now, isn't that an interesting title for an atheist? <laughs> Paul, Paul tells us in Romans 1 that there is no such thing as an atheist that God's evidence is uh, around us and we all know that there's a God. And so I have found that most of the atheists that I've met, they're not really atheists as much as they are simply angry at the kind of God they think there might be. Well, C.J. Werleman says this, we don't have any of the original manuscripts of the Bible. The originals are lost. He's right. We don't know when and we don't know by whom. That's true. What we have are copies of copies. That's true. In some instances, the copies we have are 20th generation copies. I have no idea where he got that one from. But it's interesting how he can say true statement right after another and then all of a sudden he's making something up. Here's a little bit more serious source and this is from M.M. M. Al-Azami who's a British Muslim and uh, he's a very popular uh, Muslim apologist. And in his book, The History of the Quranic Text from Revelation to Compilation, a comparative study with the Old New Testaments, he says this. The Orthodox Church, being the sect which eventually established supremacy over all the others, stood in fervent opposition to various ideas, also known as heresies, which were in circulation. These included adoptionism, the notion that Jesus was not God, but a man, docetism, the opposite view that he was God and not man, and separationism, that the divine and human elements of Jesus Christ were two separate beings. In each case, this sect, the one that would rise to become the Orthodox Church, deliberately corrupted the scriptures so as to reflect its own theological visions of Christ while demolishing that of all rival sects. What M.M. M. al Azami is saying is that we can't possibly trust that the manuscripts of the New Testament that we have today go back to the original because they were corrupted by a sect that became the majority view. It wasn't the original view. And so there were conflicting views of Christ, various interpretations of who he was and what he was, and we can't possibly get back to the original. Where do these people get their information from? A primary source, and probably the primary source, is Bart Ehrman's book, Misquoting Jesus. Bart Ehrman is a bona fide New Testament scholar. He went to a Moody Bible Institute in the days when he was an evangelical and got his bachelor's degree from Wheaton College, another evangelical school. And then he went on to Princeton Seminary to earn his uh, Master of Divinity and his PhD under Dr. Bruce Metzger, who was uh, an enormous uh, figure of the 20th century, one of the great New Testament scholars that America has ever produced. And uh, Bruce Metzger was the uh, chairman of the NRSV translation, uh, produced multiple books, uh, 
he was, he was just a, an amazing, brilliant scholar and perhaps uh, probably even the best New Testament textual critic of the 20th century. And he was an evangelical. And so Ehrman went to Princeton to study under him. And when he got done studying, he began to drift away from his evangelical roots. And then he became um, not so evangelical, then he wasn't sure there was a God. And he said, if there is a God, it's certainly not the God of the Bible. And so he's an agnostic today. He's a professor at North Carolina Chapel Hill. And he likes to debate Christians on a number of topics uh, all the time. Uh, I've had uh, three debates with him. Uh, Bart was uh, on a national championship debate team in high school. And so he had been involved in hundreds of debates before we had our first one. Uh, the three debates I've had with him, if I include those, I have now been involved in five debates in my life. More, more than half of them with Bart Ehrman. Uh, I would uh, prefer to chew glass over debating, but sometimes you're called to do things you don't like to do, and that was one that, it, it, was, it was nevertheless important. And we do have some DVDs. Did you want to mention that, Kevin, or do you put them on the back table? Okay, so you're going to mention that later? Okay, of, of our second debate that was at Southern Methodist University in uh, 2011, and uh, it was the largest attended debate ever on the text of the Bible. Over 1,400 people came. Uh, amazing, uh, amazing time. It was really fascinating. Well, we got a video, a nice video of it. Well, here's what Ehrman says. He's a bona fide New Testament scholar and a bona fide textual critic, which means this is the field we're talking about dealing with these manuscripts. Not only do we not have the originals, we don't have the first copies of the originals. We don't even have copies of the copies of the originals or copies of the copies of the copies of the originals. Maybe Wordleman can't count because he came up with 20 generations of copies with that. But uh, nevertheless, this is the source that he, he gets that his comment from. And then we've got Ehrman also saying in another place in Misquoting Jesus, the more I studied the manuscript tradition of the New Testament, the more I realized just how radically the text had been altered over the years at the hands of the scribes. It would be wrong to say, as people sometimes do, that the changes in our text have no real bearing on what the texts mean or on the theological conclusions that one draws from them. Ehrman wrote this book in 2005. Within a few weeks, he was on John Stewart's The Daily Show, and Stewart interviewed him about the book, and he said, man, this is one hell of a book, which is kind of a strange uh, accolade to give about a book about the Bible, but nevertheless, um, <laughs> the next day it went up to number one on Amazon, and I'm pretty sure he's sold over a million copies of this already. So this is hugely influential, and it's important for us to wrestle with the kinds of questions that he raises in here, and uh, I'll be uh, showing those to you. But there's two attitudes that I would like to recommend to all of you to avoid. Whether you're a Christ follower or not, these attitudes are extreme and they need to be avoided at all costs. The first is radical skepticism. The idea that we can't possibly tell what the original text said in any place. It's been translated and retranslated and copied and recopied so many times we have no idea what it said. I'll explain why we don't need to hold to that view and why in fact it's, it's really uh, an irrational and a non-empirical view to argue that way. But there's an attitude that Christians tend to fall into, and that's the opposite extreme of absolute certainty. Well, I know what's in the Word of God because it's between these two pages, between these two covers. That's what the Bible says. And uh, there's a group that's in the, in the heartland of America especially that holds to this with one particular translation, the King James Version. And I have literally heard people say, with all sincerity in Texas, you know, if the King James Bible was good enough for St. Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> when they make those kinds of comments, the next thing I say is, well, how about them cowboys? I mean, that's about the intellectual level of discussion we can have, you know. <laughs> but many other Christians subconsciously hold to something very similar. Because you take your Bible to church and you think this is what was originally written. Many of you think if you have an NIV or an NIV 2011 or TNIV or NRSV, <coughs> that that was what was the, in the original text. The problem is something that you don't recognize that each time we have a new edition of any one of these versions, they do make some minor changes as to what they consider to be the wording of the original. The NIV 2011 makes some changes in some very strategic places, and even with the Net Bible that I was the senior New Testament editor for, we're making changes for the second edition. 
uh, places where we are now convinced that that's not the original wording, we think it's something else. How certain are we? It's not absolute, I can assure you of that. But we are wrestling with the data as best we can. So these are the two attitudes to avoid, and I want to suggest where we might want to land on this. So there's four questions I want us to answer tonight. How many textual variants are there? That's the first question. It sounds like a pretty straightforward one. How many places do we have in the manuscripts where there's disagreements? And I don't mean if you have a thousand manuscripts that say Jesus and a thousand manuscripts over here for the same verse that say Lord, that we count that as a thousand variants. A textual variant is any place where at least one manuscript disagrees with a set text, maybe an established text or a printed text or something. But it's, it doesn't matter how many manuscripts it's got on its side, that still counts only as one textual variant, one textual difference. So if I have a thousand manuscripts that say Jesus and another thousand that say Lord, that's one textual variant. Okay, so we'll talk about how many there actually are. And then what kinds of textual variations are there? We're dealing, first of all, with the number of variants, then secondly, the nature of these variants. And what theological beliefs depend on textually suspect passages? It would be nice to know, Christians especially would like to know, if the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Christ, the ascension of the Lord, if salvation by grace, if these things are in jeopardy because there's uh, places in the text that every single time the, the topic comes up, the manuscripts uh, say something different. Some manuscripts say something different. Or are they uniform? We'd like to know about that. It kind of affects your view of uh, all of your life. And so we'll conclude with asking is what we have now, what they wrote then. So we begin with um, a preliminary question to this first question, and that is, don't we have the original New Testament anymore? The answer to that is no. Uh, I'm pretty sure we can say that. I know we have not discovered uh, the original manuscripts because the original New Testament manuscripts would have been written on a roll or a scroll, if you will, where they take papyrus, which is kind of the ancient type of paper, and it has the, roughly the consistency of a, a grocery sack, a paper one, not a plastic one, obviously. And uh, you've got the, the filaments of the papyrus going horizontally on one side and then vertically on the back side. And what all books were done as on papyrus was they would write on the inside, on the horizontal fibers, and then they'd roll it up until the end of the first century when a new kind of book was invented called the Codex. And the Codex is a book that we, at least some of you, some of you older generation, if you're over 40, you probably know what a Codex is. It's a book that's bound on one side and has cut pages that you can flip. If you're under 40, you've probably only used a computer and you think that's a book. And so you've, <laughs> you've gone retro on us because all you can do is scroll. You know, you, you don't have a Codex. <laughs> So, the Codex, we don't know who invented it. It came after the New Testament books were completed virtually, uh, but we do know that the Christians were the first to popularize it. Over the next five centuries, 80% of all Christian books were written on a Codex, and only 20% of all non-Christian books were written on a Codex. They were still written on a scroll. So for the first time, and probably the only time in the history of the church, Christians were ahead of the technological curve. So it'd be nice if we could figure out what technology is today too, but we still have a ways to go. We don't have any manuscripts that are written on a scroll. New Testament manuscripts, they're all on a codex. Therefore, they're not going to be the original documents. Uh, and they, they would have worn out almost surely because of Christians copying them. A Christian comes to Rome, wants to see Paul's letter to the Romans. Hey, I've got uh, time, I'm gonna be here for a few days. Do you mind if I copy this out on, on a, a scroll? And they said, sure, that's fine. Somebody else wants to do this. After they've been doing that for a few years, that original document starts to fade. And uh, people have been saying, well, what does this say? And they might smudge the text. Uh, and it starts to deteriorate and fall apart. And almost surely within a century, all the original 27 New Testament documents had turned to dust. But in the meantime, people had made copies, private copies that they took with them in, uh, from Rome to Carthage and Corinth. and. Uh, to Athens and Ephesus and Jerusalem. And these copies were promulgated. And then we had professional scribes who came later who started making copies. So we don't have the originals in terms of the actual manuscripts, but that doesn't mean we don't have the original wording anymore. Those are two separate questions. Well, if all the manuscripts, and we have quite a few of them, said the same thing, then there would be no possibility for us to get beyond those 
to the original wording. This is the case with the Quran. Muslims have a text that goes back to Khalif Uthman, who came about 50 years after Muhammad, and he gathered up all the uh, other Qurans that were in existence at the time, destroyed those, and said, here's the one official Quran. So we, we have a pretty good degree of certainty of going back to the Khalif Uthman Quran, but that's still 50 years removed from the original, and we are quite sure it doesn't look exactly like the original because he said these manuscripts all have discrepancies, and uh, he wanted to have a particular official version. We just don't know exactly what the original Quran said. The New Testament doesn't face that kind of a, a situation because we don't, we don't have official editions coming out until well into the second millennium. Christians were copying these without having an official recension uh, for the most part. But these manuscripts don't agree with each other entirely. In fact, if you take the two closest manuscripts that relate to each other, early, closely related manuscripts, you have between six and 10 textual variants per chapter. For those of you who have studied a little bit of Greek, this is Codex Vaticanus and Papyrus number 75. Now, P75 only has Luke and John in it, but if we were to extrapolate that out over the entire New Testament, 260 chapters, we'd have about 2,000 variants among these two very closely related manuscripts. And you multiply that out by all these manuscripts that really deviate from it, it's a mess. So we don't have the original New Testament, they've disappeared, and uh, the uh, manuscripts have dis uh, discrepancies among them, therefore we have to do textual criticism. Scholars have to look at the data and decide on the basis of the existing evidence what is most probably the original wording. So let me talk about the number of variants then. I'm finally getting to that first question, and this one will take up about half of our time, and then the other three I go quickly. I, I have a history of doing prefaces that are about 45 minutes of a 50 minute lecture, but uh, <laughs> maybe I should, my, my wife likes me, okay, I'm, I've, never, I've never mentioned this in public. My, my wife, she always wants me to get to the point. So I wrote this big thick grammar, a couple of you asked me to sign it tonight, it's 850 pages long. It took me 17 years to write, it's a Greek grammar that, that's used in seminaries all over the place. And then I wrote an abridged grammar for I'm not, I can't mention this on film, I'll tell you later, Kevin, what, what, what particular denomination I wrote it for, but you can guess. Yeah, you, I know you know what it is now, so. Um, and the abridged grammar is about one-third the length of the big one. And on the dedication page, it has two words, to Patty. That's it. Because my wife, that's my wife's name, she always wants me to get to the bottom line now. And so, anyway, uh, I'm not doing that in this lecture, sorry. She's not here, she can't uh, tell me what to do. All right, so what is a textual variant? Let's begin with that. It's any place among the manuscripts in which there's a variation in wording, including word order, omission or addition of words, even spelling differences, all of that counts. Those are textual variants. Now, how many variants do we actually have? So finally, we get to the first question and the first answer to it. In the Greek New Testament, the critically established Greek New Testament that's used throughout the world in any uh, theological institute, seminaries, it's used by uh, missionary translators, uh, professors, pastors. It's produced by an institute in Münster, Germany. And there are approximately 140,000 words in that Greek New Testament. Or to be more precise, 138,162. And don't ask me how I know that number. But the first time I went to uh, a baseball game was Dodger Stadium, Chavez Ravine. Saw a doubleheader with Don Drysdale and Sandy Koufax, and so Sandy Koufax set some kind of a record for strikeouts, and my dad was all excited about taking me. I was eight years old, and takes me home, and he says, so, what'd you think of the game? Or the games, and I said, well, Dad, I, I can't remember, but do you know how many lights there are in this stadium? <laughs> and, and I said, it's like 56,380, and do you know how many light bulbs are burned out? And I, that's all I did for two games, so. <laughs> I think I'm related to Brother Andrew. <laughs> How many texture variants do we have? We don't know. It's so many, we haven't been able to count them all. But here's the best estimate. It's about 400,000. Now, Bart Ehrman, in his book, Misquoting Jesus, says it's between three and 400,000. I actually suggested the number 400,000 to him years ago, so I'm going on the upper limit on that. Uh, I, think, uh, I think that's all the time we have for it. Let's close in prayer, shall we? <laughs> I'm going to tell you what Paul Harvey used to do. I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. 
Two and a half variants for every word in the New Testament on average? That's atrocious. How in the world could we get back to the original text? Well, let's take a look at this. The reason that we have a lot of textual variants is that we have a lot of manuscripts. And I mean a lot of manuscripts. When it comes to the New Testament, there is nothing in the ancient world that even comes close. Uh, and uh, they're, they're, the closest is Homer's Iliad. He's got an 800, 900 year head start on the New Testament and still could, uh, can't even come close to what we have. Well, here's, here's what the data are. Well, get, let me give you a quotation from 301 years ago from the great scholar Richard Bentley, who was remarking, he did a book called Remarks Upon a Discourse of Free Thinking. This was a book where he talks about a publication of the Greek New Testament that had been done six years earlier by a man named John Mill. And Mill was uh, one of these uh, uh, Cambridge, uh, uh, Oxford graduates, and he had spent 30 years of his life examining 100 Greek New Testament manuscripts, writing out all the variants among those 100 manuscripts, checking out what church fathers, these are ancient uh, scholars and pastors and, and preachers, what they had to say when they quoted from the New Testament, and looking at ancient translations or versions like Latin and Syriac and Coptic. And he read all this material for 30 years, produced a two volume text with footnotes or an apparatus. And in that, he discovered 30,000 textual variants. This was 300 years ago. He discovered 30,000 variants with only 100 manuscripts. You'll see soon enough how many we actually have today. And so Catholics were delighted at this. They said, you Protestants, have a paper po pope, but he's got footnotes. We don't know when he's really speaking next cathedra. And some Protestants were really mad at John Mill's work because they said, this is the work of the devil. We're supposed to follow just this text, the Textus Receptus, that was the Greek text behind the King James Bible, and so they must have felt that that was good enough for Paul too, I guess. But uh, basically they were upset at him for looking at actual handwritten biblical manuscripts, calling it the work of the devil. Well, that's kind of stupid. I think good historical research is always something that is noble and is something that Christians should be involved in. Well, two weeks exactly after John Mill's two-volume set came out, he died. He timed it perfectly. <laughs> when I do my magnum opus, I want to die two weeks later <laughs> because I don't want to have to hear the criticisms. <laughs> and so he didn't. So Richard Bentley took up the mantle, and here's one of the things he said. If there had been but one manuscript of the Greek Testament at the restoration of learning about century, two centuries ago, then we would have had no various readings at all. If we had only one manuscript, there's no differences in it. And would the text be in a better condition then than it is now that we have 30,000 variant readings? It is good, therefore, to have more anchors than one, and another manuscript to join the first would give more authority as well as security. In other words, Bentley is looking at these variants and saying, this actually helps us. Now we can compare this manuscript and this manuscript. And even though both of them might be the same date, same century, we can tell that this manuscript's text actually goes back earlier than this one because this one must have been based on that. By the, the sifting of uh, these uh, comparisons, we can actually tell those things. So this was a, a remarkable uh, statement that Benley made. And let me just kind of show you where we're at 300 years later. Again, this was based on John Mill looking at all the Greek New Testament manuscripts he could find in Europe, 100 manuscripts. Today, Greek manuscripts alone, we have 5,838. Actually, I should correct this. As of last week, it's now 5,839. There was a new majuscule. It's a capital letter manuscript uh, from the first millennium that was discovered. But, so this, was a, uh, this number was good since September, but. Just, just about a week ago, we found another one. So 5,839. So you, you're the first group to hear this that I just had to update the numbers. That's kind of cool. I hope you have a good audio on that camera because I want them to hear that, you know, the, 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 the text here is wrong, even though it's in all the PowerPoints. Anyway, uh, so all, all, the, all the manuscripts have it wrong, but anyway, you, I'm, I'm giving conjecture. Forget that. Uh, okay. Well. Gosh, I'm confused. I need to give you kind of an unnatural segue anyway, so. Here we go. Before we go on and talk about the manuscripts, I want to talk to you about the work of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. Why do I want to do that? Both because Kevin asked me to do it and because I'm standing up here and you're not. And I get to talk about whatever I want to, so I'm going to do this. And uh, I think you'll actually like this. What is CSNTM? 
It's a nonprofit institute that I founded uh, 14 or 12 years ago. Yeah, 12, that's right, I, I'm not good at math. Although I can count light bulbs. <laughs> and it's dedicated to digitally photographing all handwritten manuscripts of the New Testament, all 5,839 of them. And to use these manuscripts to get back to the original wording of the New Testament as much as is humanly possible. It's a massive tax, uh, uh, task. So far, we have photographed over 400 New Testament manuscripts. Altogether, about a quarter of a million pages have been photographed. The average Greek New Testament manuscript has over 450 pages of text. That's the average. Altogether, there are 2.6 million pages of Greek New Testament manuscripts to photograph. We've photographed almost 10% of those, which means, among other things, this is great job security for me. <laughs> now, we're also collaborating with other institutes to recover the earliest form of the New Testament text, especially this institute in Munster that produces all the critical Greek New Testaments today. So we're starting to give these digital images to this institute in Munster, Germany, and they're publishing Greek New Testaments, and then modern uh, translations of the New Testament, a proclamation of the gospel, are based on these uh, uh, new uh, critical Greek texts. And essentially, what's remarkable is this very tiny institute. We have four employees, only two of whom are full-time, uh, CSNTM. We are starting to stand at the head of the stream of all future Bible translations. It's just remarkable how God has blessed this. And I've come to the deep conviction that God is more interested in Scripture than we are because we have been places where we sh the door should have been shut down on us. Uh, all sorts of amazing things have happened, and yet he opens the door and gets us into places where we get to shoot these manuscripts. So what we're doing in an indirect, but it's, or, uh, it's a long chain, but it's not uh, an immediate payoff, is we're affecting the faith and practice of Christians throughout the world. Now in the beginning there was microfilm, and it was not good. <laughs> This is the kind of photographs that scholars used to have to work with, except it wouldn't be blown up nearly that size, you know, on a microfilm reader. And they said, skip reading the, the stuff in the margins, you can't see it, try to read the text, but you'd have to know where you are in the New Testament to even be able to read that. This just looks like bumps and lines to me, but I, I, there's some clues on how I can find out, but it's, it's, this is what scholars have had to use essentially until 12 years ago. Here's one that was, uh, uh, this is a photograph of a manuscript uh, that uh, the Institute in Munster purchased because this, this uh, library actually photographed it themselves. This, this is a microfilm. Uh, and uh, they, uh, this, the Munster Institute, uh, I should tell you the name of the place uh, so you can remember. It's Institute für Neue Testament, like a text for schon. Um, <laughs> I'll just call it Munster, that'll be easier. So anyway. Uh, they came to us and said, hey, did you photograph this manuscript on this uh, uh, island? Oh yeah, we got it. Could we see those pictures? Because this is what we're dealing with. And so here's uh, the comparison between these two. Same page. This is Romans chapter 1. And you can see it's a little bit easier to read. <laughs> this manuscript is one of the, the worst manuscripts I've ever seen in terms of a child's doodling in it. On almost every page, some kid has mar marked it up. And uh, I, I see in, in uh, manuscripts, and I, I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts now, I see typically the Greek alphabet written out in a child's hand once, and only once. Now you gotta have a little bit of a sanctified imagination to figure out what happened. It was probably invite, an obscure relative to the monastery day, and some uh, third uh, cousin uh, comes from some place who's about four years old, and here you've got this monk in there that's working on this manuscript, and the cousin wants to see what he's doing. And the monk goes and takes a cigarette break, oh, maybe not that, but something, <laughs> coffee break, and uh, comes back and the kid has just marked up the manuscript. And so, anyway, uh, you see it typically just once in a manuscript, but almost every manuscript has got the child's hand. Here's a, this is even closer. It's, it's amazing, you don't, even know to, you don't even need to know Greek to be able to read this, it's that easy to, to follow. <laughs> here's, here's a manuscript that we discovered in Romania. It's 1,000 years old. Look at this, the, the bright, vibrant covers, uh, colors. Um, it's just almost as good as it was 1,000 uh, years ago. This is a little bit closer to the same page. This is a lectionary. This is the beginning of uh, Mark's, uh, Matthew's Gospel. So it's, you know, it's a little bit fuzzy up there, but here, it, you all come around here, you can take a look at it on my computer <laughs> screen. But 
Anyway, this is, this is what's so fun. I've actually had high school students tell me after I've lectured on the text of the New Testament, I want to grow up and become a texture critic. You never would have gotten that when you showed microfilms. <laughs> uh, so our priorities in photographing manuscripts are to go to poor or politically unstable countries. That's a very high priority. We don't say, you are a poor or politically unstable country, therefore we'd like to come visit you. So uh, we don't ever say that to them, but that's where we're trying to go because the manuscripts are at greatest risk there. We go where the, we have leads on uncatalogued manuscripts, manuscripts that Munster doesn't know about. If Munster doesn't know about them, New Testament scholars don't know about them. And manuscripts that are known to be significant. And finally, every Greek New Testament manuscript. Well, some of the sites we visited, uh, the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, that's the equivalent of the Vatican to the Eastern Orthodox world, Monastery of St. John the Theologian on the island of Patmos. It's a 900-year-old monastery where John wrote the book of Revelation. And uh, we get to sit down and eat with the priests every day at uh, lunch uh, in a, in a 900-year-old dining room with 30-foot-long stone tables. It's just, just awesome the National Archives of Tirana, Albania, where we discovered about 30 New Testament manuscripts that were unknown in the West. This was 2007, and it hit about 100 international newspapers. Uh, University of Michigan, you say, well, gee, why'd you list that? Because it has the largest collection of Greek New Testament manuscripts in North America. It's uh, amazing. Uh, Cambridge University, several of the colleges there, the Bavarian State Library in Munich, which is just a beautiful place. The Museum of Literature in Yash, Romania, uh, that has no good road to get into it. You have to take out hernia insurance when you drive in. We, we, it was 35 kilometers in and out on just a terrible, terrible road with potholes everywhere. And in our brand new rental SUV, when we finally got off that bad road, the rear bumper fell off the car, <laughs> literally fell off the car. So, but it was, it was worth it. That was the manuscript I just showed you the pictures of, that thousand-year-old manuscript, that's the, ones we, uh, the one we shot there. Uh, Biblioteca Medici, uh, Laurentiana in Florence, I'll tell you more about that. And the Chester Beatty Library, I'll tell you a little bit more about that, that's in Dublin. Uh, phenomenal mm -hmm. manuscripts. But here's uh, one of the things we photographed in Albania. This is a purple codex. A purple codex is one where they take the parchment and they dip it in purple ink, they dye it in the purple ink, and then all the letters that they write on the manuscript are in gold or silver. And it's only of the Gospels. We only have six of them in the world. And all the words are in silver in this manuscript except four words. Every time they show up, they write these in gold. God, Lord, Jesus, and Christ. Now, just the very formatting of the Word of God, what does that tell you about what this scribe thought about Jesus? Four words in gold. God, Lord, Jesus, and Christ. Jesus Christ is our God and our Lord. It's remarkable to see this kind of thing. Well, this manuscript is not in great condition because it was hidden under the stones behind the sacristy in this monastery in the mountains of Barat during World War II. And Hitler sent some uh, Nazi soldiers to uh, confiscate this from the monks. And they, uh, they grabbed all the monks and the uh, old men from uh, the village, lined them up, and they were ready to shoot these, these uh, old, old men, and they said, Tell us where this manuscript is or you will die. Hitler really did like to get these religious icons and things. He thought it would give him an edge in, in uh, war. So the Raiders of the Lost Ark actually has an element of truth in it. And um, so the first man said, I don't know where it is. There was a long pause. And then the second man said, I don't know where it is. Third man, right on down the line. Every single one of them said, I don't know where this manuscript is. And then a very long pause. And then some discussion among the soldiers, and then they packed up their guns and left town. Grade B miracle. I mean, the, the Nazis actually believed somebody. And uh, so a few days later, the abbot came back from visiting the, the local villagers in, in and around the, the monastery. And there was a long line outside of his office of monks and old men confessing their sins <laughs> for having lied to the Nazi soldiers about not knowing where this manuscript was. They had hidden it underneath one of the stones behind the sacristy, and it got a lot of humidity in it, and that's why you get the frayed edges and things. Finally, it made its way to the National Archives in Tirana, and uh, it, when it was put on display there, uh, there was a line uh, going a, a half mile outside of the museum to see this manuscript, even though Albanians don't speak Greek, 
These old men didn't speak Greek, and yet they were willing to sacrifice their lives for a unique handwritten copy of the Word of God. Just, just remarkable. Well, that's just one of the kind of stories, although not a typical story of uh, some of the places I've been to. Uh, Florence, the Biblioteca Medicia, Lorenziana, this is the only library in the world that Michelangelo designed. And uh, the, uh, he, he made the ceiling identical to the floor. It was a mirror image of it. And what you see all along the fo floor on the outer edges are these uh, 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 cow skulls. Why on earth would Michelangelo have cow skulls in the floor and the ceiling? Well, it's because it was cattle that gave their lives to make the parchment manuscripts. And he was honoring them this way. It's just, just remarkable. I mean, that's kind of bizarre the first time you see, you see that. You say, what in the world is he thinking? And we've been to various uh, sites in Athens. Um, here's part of the problem with Athens. When we were there in 2010, this is what it looked like. And 2011 and 2012 to a degree. We were there three years in a row right in the middle of uh, riots in the museum district and the banking district and of course the museum is where you get these manuscripts that we photographed. Every day we'd take a taxi, we were told to take a different route to get to the museum, different museums we'd be going to. Uh, one day I walked into tear gas. Um, it's, you know, Greece is kind of on a meltdown. It really is on a meltdown and I, I'm very concerned about the country. Uh, they have about a third of all the Greek New Testament manuscripts in, in that country. They're in 253 different sites throughout the world, so Greece doesn't have all of them, but they have a, a number that are very precious. This is a little bit more of an exotic place in Greece, uh, Greece up in uh, the Valley of Thessaly, uh, about uh, six hours north by the highway. And they've, uh, this is Matera. It's stone pillars that ride, rise up from this valley below. It's one of the most unbelievable places on earth. Uh, I understand that a James Bond movie was filmed here, so maybe if you're a James Bond uh, fan, you might recognize it. But some of these stone pillars go up 1,400 feet from the valley below, and about 1,000 years ago, monks began to build monasteries on the top. And so uh, it's this kind of a, a place, just unbelievable. Well, for a long time, this was how you got up there. <laughs> it's the only access to these monasteries for 900 years. And here's what it's like while you're just kind of on your way up the hill. <laughs> Uh, you better have taken your potty break before you start, I think. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Well, about 1920, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back here. About 1920 or so, uh, there was a woman who got on one of these, uh, got in one of these nets. Uh, she was quite obese, and um, uh, it, the rope broke. And it wasn't the first time that it happened. In fact, People used to ask the monks, uh, how do you know when you're supposed to change the rope? Well, God lets us know. <laughs> so apparently God let them know, I guess, this is the time to change the rope. But now the national government moved in and said, you know, you're not going to transport people by rope. Now we're going to have a little walkway so they can get up there. So that's a little bit more civil how we get there today. But it's just an amazing place with quite a few manuscripts. This is St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai in Egypt about five hours north from the, the southern tip of the, uh, sea, um, the Red Sea. And uh, this is the oldest monastery, continuously inhabited monastery in the world, built in about 550 A.D. Uh, remarkable place. This is where the oldest complete New Testament was discovered in 1859. And in 1975, uh, they discovered after a fire had been in one of the kitchens, and they put the fire out, there was a, a geniza or a storeroom underneath the floorboards of the kitchen that nobody knew was there. And in 1975, they started to dig this out and they discovered that this storeroom had a number of manuscripts in it. Over the next 24 years, they started uh, to catalog those manuscripts and they published a list that came out in modern Greek in 1999. 1,200 manuscripts were discovered. They still haven't gone through very many of these. We were one of the, one of the first outsiders to, to see these manuscripts. I looked at four of them in the week I was at St. Catherine's and discovered two others that were inside those four. Uh, and uh, it, it, they also discovered 50,000 fragments of manuscripts. It's just, it's a massive cache and it's gonna take years, decades to digitize those and to discover everything that they've discovered. It's just, just amazing. This catapulted St. Catherine's into number two position in the world for having ancient manuscripts just after a little place uh, called the Vatican. 
Well, here I am with uh, Father Justin, who is now the librarian. This is the wonder of Photoshop. It can make me look skinny. <laughs> he really is that thin. Uh, but uh, he used to be known as Russell Hicks from El Paso. That just doesn't sound as good in St. Catharines in Egypt. So he's now Father Justin, and he is the librarian. And uh, here's uh, just what the li it's not a really elegant looking library, but it's just the, the, the uh, climate is perfect for preserving these manuscripts. And one of the things that they have in here uh, are um, halon tubes. You see this one, you can see here's the others. Halon tubes, like you've seen in Terminator 2, are tubes that suck all the oxygen out of a room. Remember when uh, Schwarzenegger gave uh, uh, Sarah and John Connor the masks? That's when, because the halon tubes were sucking the oxygen out of the room. In case of a fire, it sucks all the oxygen out of the room and the fire dies in any biological life form also dies. And uh, s the manuscripts are preserved that way. Uh, so they, <laughs> you know, they give priority to the manuscripts over life. And uh, I, I happen to agree with that sentiment. So um, <laughs> that's why this is the last time you'll ever have me speak here, I think. <laughs> anyway, here's some of the manuscripts that we have discovered. We've discovered over 20,000 pages of manuscripts, second to the 17th century. We've discovered about 75 New Testament manuscripts, more than all the institutes and individuals in the world combined have discovered in the last 12 years. Uh, that's why I'm convinced God is very concerned about preserving Scripture and has been blessing the work of CSNTM. This is uh, a, a palimpsest. It's a manuscript that was scraped over centuries later. By the way, I'm going to start showing you some pictures of manuscripts. We've only got about 250,000 pictures to go, so just sit back, relax, take your shoes off, we'll have a good time. Gosh, I wish I could tell you. I, I, I wish I could tell you about this. I'm not going to be able to tell you about it, but it's, it's uh, from about the 5th to 7th century. It's two leaves. A palimpsest is where a scribe scrapes off the text and centuries later is when the scribe writes material on top of it. Rather than kill a goat and put two more leaves in the back of his uh, codex, he cannibalizes an older manuscript from several hundred years earlier and scrapes off the text and reuses that. So um, this is how we discovered this. They brought out the wrong manuscript and we found this, this one inside. It was just amazing. These are icons of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they typically always look that way. I mean, Mark is crying. Luke looks angry, probably just had to pay taxes to Matthew. And uh, <laughs> anyway, there's, uh, uh, but um, these are of icons of manuscripts that we discovered. Now, I'm segueing into Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. Chester Beatty was an American mining baron who ended up helping Winston Churchill during World War II moved to England, and then he moved to Ireland, became Ireland's first honorary citizen. And this last summer, CSNTM uh, got the great privilege to digitize the Chester Beatty Greek biblical manuscripts. And we photographed all of those, including their papyri, which includes the oldest manuscript of Paul's letters in the world. Nine of Paul's letters are in it. This is a part of uh, Mark's gospel, I think. Uh, but uh, there are 86 of the original 104 leaves of Paul's original manuscript that are still intact. And it's written about 130 years after the time that Paul had lived. We have the oldest copy of uh, Mark's Gospel in the Chester Beatty Papyri. The oldest copy of the Book of Revelation in the Chester Beatty Papyri. Just remarkable things. The only other time they've ever been photographed to be published was in the 1930s. And so we came in with some digital cameras, about $100,000 worth of equipment, and uh, six of us worked there for a month uh, to digitize this at, at great expense to ourselves. But uh, again, the Lord is, shines his face on us and raises the money for us. Well, here's uh, what we decided to do is shoot it against a black background. That's what the library wanted. But a black background, although it's aesthetically pleasing, you can't tell if there's a hole in the manuscript or if it's ink. So you also have to shoot it against a white background. And so we said, we'll shoot it against the black if we can shoot it against a white also. So we did that. And we're seeing different things now. We're starting to read text that has never been read before in these manuscripts, these extraordinarily important manuscripts. And uh, we're starting to see some things that just were not visible before. It's just amazing. Well, where can you see these manuscripts? And I mean, you can see all the ones uh, that I've shown you, uh, except for one or two that I'm not allowed to post online. 
at the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, or csntm.org. If you remember CS as in C.S. Lewis, you got the first two letters. And if you've ever watched Wizard of Oz, you know who Auntie M is. So you got the three <laughs> last three letters. So, but uh, this, that's where you go to the manuscripts page. So go to CS and Tim, you'll go down the left side, you see the manuscripts and you can find all these. And this is uh, manuscript P46. This is the size of each page. Isn't that amazing? This is Paul's letters. And we're missing just a little bit off the outside edges for most of these pages. It's just absolutely astounding. So this is um, 2 Corinthians, uh, the first leaf of 2 Corinthians. It's just, it's just so easy to read. It's just amazing. Uh, wonderful uh, manuscripts to be able to, to photograph, and that's what we've been doing. Well, how many manuscripts are there left to be discovered? We have 5,839. I think there's another 1,000 left in the world to be discovered. Uh, most of them in the old Soviet bloc countries some in the Middle East, but we have a, a lot more to look for. Okay, well that was a lot longer side note than I expected it to be, uh, but let's get back to the embarrassment of riches, and I'll try to go through this a little bit faster. Sorry, it's, is this okay? It's, it's all right with you, okay, all right. Okay, well, not only do we have Greek manuscripts, we have Latin manuscripts. We have over 10,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, and when I say a manuscript, I'm talking about a handwritten, unique copy before the time of the printing press of the New Testament, almost twice as many in Latin as we have in Greek. And uh, the reason is because Latin swept over Western Europe, became the lingua franca from the fourth century on, and so we have so many more manuscripts in Latin. Starting in the early third or possibly even late second century, they started to get translated into Latin. Other ancient versions like Coptic and Syriac and Georgian, Gothic, Armenian, Old Church, Slavonic, uh, remarkable uh, languages and versions. Best estimates, at least five to 10,000 manuscripts in these other languages, and that's really a conservative estimate. Now, if I had a magic wand and could wipe out all those manuscripts in one fell swoop, we would still not be left without a witness. And that's because of patristic authors or church fathers. These scholars who wrote homilies, sermons, theological treatises, uh, commentaries, and they did not have the gift of brevity. Uh, they would write and write and write and they'd comment on a verse. And the great thing about what the church fathers did is they'd, you know, if you want to know, is this what, the, the, what that verse actually said in the third century or the second century AD? Sometimes you'll see a church father who, say, who makes a point of a particular word in that verse. And then he starts expounding on that one word. Well, we have a pretty darn good idea that that word in that manuscript existed at that time because of what the church father has to say. It's very helpful. So if we wiped out all these manuscripts, we wouldn't be left without a witness because of these church fathers. To date, well over a million quotations from the New Testament have been found in the writings of the church fathers. That's just astounding. I have no idea how to even measure that because I'm now going to show you a measurement, a comparison between the New Testament and an average classical work. The average classical Greek writer has less than 20 copies of his work still in existence. And that's really a very, very high estimate for the average. Most of them are about two or three, but this is what I've used in, in my debates. Nobody's ever disputed the numbers because they're, they're really, uh, I'm, I'm giving the advantage to the other guys as much as I possibly can and it's, and it's indisputable. You stack that up, it'd be four feet high. Well, how high do you think the stack of New Testament manuscripts would be? You think it would hit the ceiling? Maybe a little bit more than that. Let's take a look, see, see how high it'll go. Of course, I have to do it sideways because uh, I don't have a PowerPoint that can go that high. That's as much as I wanted to do. Uh, it's not quite accurate. Multiply that New Testament stack by at least eight. And what you get is a stack that's more than one mile high of manuscripts compared to four feet high for the average classical writer. The best of the classical world is Homer. We have about 10% as many manuscripts of Homer as we do of the New Testament. And about 90% of those are very small fragments that have been discovered in the last 50 years. This is astounding. Now, if I were to compare this with Greco-Roman historians and biographers, from right around the time of the New Testament, sometimes even earlier, uh, 
Pliny the Elder, we're waiting 700 years before we get a single copy of Pliny the Elder. Plutarch's Lies, very famous biographer, 800 years before we get a single copy. Josephus, who wrote about the antiquities of the Jews and the Jewish war, he was our principal Jewish historian of the first century AD. He lived from about 37 to 100, and we know about the war between Rome and uh, Israel, especially because of the writings of Josephus, but we also know about Herod the Great and uh, his, his uh, sons and grandsons. Uh, because of Josephus. We're waiting 800 years before we have a single copy of Antiquities of the Jews, and the reason that we have 20 copies of that particular manuscript, that particular book, is because Christians were faithful to copy it out. Why? Because once it mentions James, the brother of the Lord, once it mentions John the Baptist, and once it mentions uh, Jesus Christ. So Christians would spend a year or two to copy out a copy of Antiquities of the Jews because of those three references. Polybius, 1,200 years before we get a single copy. Pausanias, who gave a geography of Greece, 1,400 years. Herodotus, 1,500 years before we get any manuscript larger than just a small sliver. And Xenophon, who is, uh, his Hellenica is a remarkable book, 1,800 years before we get anything more than uh, small, very tiny fragments. Now think about that. Let's say that were the case with the New Testament. Just use a little bit of imagination here. Now, Xenophon comes quite some time before the New Testament. But if that's the New Testament, and we're waiting 1,800 years after the completion of the New Testament before we get anything bigger than just a couple small fragments, that would essentially be saying our earliest significant New Testament copies came at about the time that the Wright brothers invented the airplane. Now, are we going to say, oh, well, yeah, that goes back to the original. And yet Xenophon scholars and Herodotus and Pausanias and Polybius scholars, they have no other choice. They say, it probably does go back pretty darn well back to the original. We don't have much else that we can uh, claim here because we don't have a lot of copies. There's lots of gaps, but that's the best they can do. And when you compare the New Testament to any of these writings, we have far more manuscripts, far earlier manuscripts than anything else. It's just absolutely sad. It doesn't matter how you slice it. The New Testament comes out way, way ahead. Now, if all of our New Testament manuscripts were 1,500, 1,800 years later, and we had thousands of them, that might cause a problem, but that's not the case. Uh, we have some manuscripts that are very, very early, even back to the second century. And so I'll briefly tell you about the discovery of papyrus number 52, or P-52. This is not a successor to the P-51 uh, airplane in World War II, um, but uh, this is a fragment of a papyrus. And before I even show you a picture of it, let me set the stage for you. In 1844, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, the father of the Tübingen School in Tübingen, uh, uh, southern Germany, uh, basically took Hegelian dialectic and applied it to the New Testament. Now, you may say, I, well, I didn't want to come and get big 50-cent words tonight, uh, but I actually understand that you do because Kevin said you guys are really, really bright, so uh, I'm, I'm trying not to use too much bad language here. But um, Bauer applied Hegelian dialectic. Now, you all know that from thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? That, you, you all know that. That's Hegelian dialectic. He learned from Professor Hegel how to come up with that. Or if you're a father of teenage boys like I was, um, I mean, they're not teen uh, still father boys, but they're not teenagers anymore. Anyway, here's the thesis. No, your hair is going to be short. Here's the antithesis. No, my hair is going to be long. Here's the synthesis. His hair is long. So <laughs> that's just how it works. Well, what, what Bauer did is he argued that the Gospel of John cannot be written any earlier than AD 160 by this philosophical construct, and it should be dated closer to AD 170. And for 90 years, that was the prevailing view that John's Gospel is absolutely worthless for historical material about the life of Jesus. And then in 1934, a fellow by the name of C.H. Roberts was examining some papyrus fragments at Manchester University in central England, and he came across this fragment that's about the size of a credit card, three and a half inches tall, two and a half inches wide. And on one side, he saw John 18, verses 31 through 33. Now, at first, he couldn't figure out what it was. He could read the letters, but didn't know exactly what the text was. But immediately, he knew it was a Christian manuscript when he flipped it around on the back because it was written on both sides. Therefore, it was a codex, not a scroll. That piqued his interest. And he sent photographs of this to the three leading papyrologists, papyri scholars in Europe at the time, each one of them wrote back independently and said, this manuscript cannot be dated later than 150, 
should be dated closer to 100, a fourth demurred. And he said, no, I think it's probably written in the 90s. In the 90s. Now, I don't know about you. I, I grew up in Newport Beach. Most of you probably grew up around here. But the kind of education I got, I liked. Uh, and I was taught that, generally speaking, copies of a manuscript are not written before the original of a manuscript. Is, is that something you'd be taught here, too? I would think so. This set two tons of German scholarship to the flames. One small fragment. And so here's an ounce of evidence that's worth a pound of presumption. You can have all sorts of philosophical constructs and arguments, but let's look at the actual historical evidence, and it looks quite different from what we sometimes think. Well, has the Bible been translated and retranslated so many times that we don't know what it originally said? Here's another way to look at this. In 1611, the King James Bible came out. The New Testament was based on seven Greek New Testament manuscripts, all of them partial. The earliest of these was from the 11th century. So it was 600 years older than the King James Bible. Now, 402 years later, oops, 403 years later, um, we have over 5,800 Greek New Testament manuscripts, almost 1,000 times as many, and the earliest of which go back almost 1,000 years earlier. And we still have those seven. So as time goes on, we're not getting farther and farther away from the original. We're getting closer and closer to it. And so the bottom line is, you know, as far as the quantity of variants and the quantity of manuscripts, the more data we have, the better we can have some kind of assurance that what we have in our hands is what the apostles actually originally wrote. Okay, that's the first question. The other three will take about 10 minutes, so we'll go through those. <laughs> The quality of variants, or the nature of the variants. What kinds of variants are there? Well, 99% make virtually no difference at all. Of the 400,000, in fact, it's, I'd say it's about 99.75. I'd say uh, that we have only about 1,000 out of the 400,000 textual variants that make any difference. That's pretty amazing. There are differences like uh, differences in spelling, for example. <laughs> Sorry. So. I'm glad you caught that. Some places I go, they don't need me. <laughs> you do this in Arkansas, forget it. <laughs> oh, do I have any Arkansans here? Okay, I'll, I'll tell my jokes a little bit slower for you. All right, so. <laughs> All right, so. There's a thing known as the movable new, which is N at the end of a word when you have the next word start with a vowel in Greek, just like a book and apple, or in Arkansas, a book, a apple. Uh, so maybe I should pick on um, Berkeley folks, shouldn't I? Because we're in Palo Alto, yes, yeah, that, that would work. Uh, then there's different names in Greek. The name for John in Greek is always spelled Ioannes or Ioannes, one N or two Ns, there's always differences. There's word order in Greek, differences that don't affect anything. It only affects emphasis because you can say John loves Mary and put those three words in any order you want and a Greek will always read it as John loves Mary because the ending of the words tell you what is the subject and what is the uh, object. And then there's the use of the definite article, the word the. I did my master's thesis. I spent over 1,200 hours writing a master's thesis on when the does not occur in the Greek New Testament. And then I did my doctoral dissertation on when it does occur. This is the most common word in the New Testament. There's 20,000 of them. And my two works could cure the most hopeless insomniac. <laughs> I still don't know why the word the is used with proper names. But in Luke 3, we read about the Joseph and the Mary left Jerusalem. We don't ever translate it that way. Most languages don't translate it that way. We're just not sure why that's what it is. So it's something about emphasis, but it's not about essential meaning. So I decided to ask myself a question. How many ways are there to say John loves Mary in Greek? Well, John has a couple different spellings. Mary has four or five different spellings. And let's take a look. This will show up on the test, so you can start taking notes if you would. Here's the first eight ways you can say John loves Mary in Greek. And of course, I have to put it in Greek because you know what the translation is. And then uh, somehow the numbers didn't show up on this, but uh, 9 through 16, 16 different ways to say John loves Mary in Greek. Isn't that amazing? Every time it means John loves Mary. Oh, there's others. Yeah, there's a few more. <laughs> okay, that was, I'm sorry, that was uh, 96, I think. Now, if we add conjunctions that are often untranslated, 
there's some conjunctions that the translation that students are supposed to put on their quizzes is an untranslatable conjunction. That's the answer for the vocabulary question. And if you leave it blank, you get it wrong, but you still can't translate it. Um, so these are conjunctions that are typically not translated. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. Every single one of these is a different sentence in Greek. Every single one. There's something different from the previous sentence. 384 ways to say John loves Mary in Greek without at all changing the essential meaning. It's always John, it's always Mary, and it's always the same word for loves, by the way, which never changes. Now, there's other legitimate word orders that swell the numbers to over 500, and if you use a different verb for loves, now you mushroom the numbers to almost 1,200. Now, that, I hope you appreciate all those slides. That was half of the lecture tonight, just zip through those. <laughs> And it took me eight hours to put all that Greek together, so you better really appreciate that. Um, anyway, but then again, I count light bulbs at Chavez Ravine, so. Okay. Bart Ehrman said, we could go on nearly forever talking about specific places in which the text of the New Testament came to be changed, either accidentally or intentionally. The examples are not just in the hundreds, but in the thousands. He's right. And the vast majority of them are just like the ones I just showed you about John Loves Mary. We could talk about them forever, but you'd be in worse shape about trying to stay awake than reading my dissertation. Uh, it's, it's boring. No text or critic spends time on that because it, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the basic meaning of the text. And so if we can say John loves Mary over a thousand times in Greek without substantially changing the meaning, the number of textual variants for the New Testament is meaningless. 400,000, so what? What really counts is the nature of these variants. That's really where the bottom line comes to. And let's take a look at that then. So the smallest group of variants are those that are meaningful and viable. That is, they have a good chance of being authentic. It goes back to early manuscripts, important manuscripts, something like that. Um, and yet less than 1% of all textual variants fit this category, both meaningful variants and viable. And I think it's about one-fourth of 1%. One Let me give you an illustration. Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. Let the one who has insight calculate the beast's number, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Everybody knows. The Antichrist, that's 666. If you were to Google 666, please don't do it now, but if you did, you would see some of the looniest stuff on the internet. It's just unbelievable. Uh, and you see, and these people are driving on the freeways? It's just, it's really scary. Um, but I'm not so sure that that's the Antichrist number. In 1843, the same man who, in 1859, would discover the oldest complete New Testament, a fellow by the name of Constantine von Tischendorf, was at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And he was looking at a palimpsest. You already know what a palimpsest is. I showed you that, where the manuscript was scraped over. This was one that was scraped over and used 800 years later. And the undertext was written in the fifth century. And it had originally, we don't have all the leaves anymore, but originally the whole Bible in it, in the fifth century, in the 400s. And what Tischendorf did is he wrote down in the very front of this manuscript what each page had, because the, the scribe who scraped these leaves and put them in, put them in upside down and in different orders. And I had the great privilege in 2009 of going and examining that manuscript, spending a day with it. It was like, it was like Christmas in July for me. It was just awesome. And I went to Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, and I noticed, even though it's a palimpsest, the undertext, as clear as day, said that the number of the beast is 616. Up until 1999, that was the only manuscript we knew of that had that number for the Antichrist. And then at Oxford uh, University, at the Ashmolean Museum, they discovered another papyrus fragment. In fact, 26 fragments that span over nine chapters in Revelation, and for chapter 13, it's the oldest fragment we have, the oldest manuscript we have for Book of Revelation. And I had the opportunity in 2003 to examine that under both a magnifying glass and a microscope. And sure enough, it says, without erasures, without changes, the number of the beast is 616. Now, we have one of the most important biblical manuscripts, this Codex C, or Ephraim Rescriptus in Paris. It's considered to be one of the two most important uh, manuscripts for the Book of Revelation. And then the earliest manuscript for Revelation 13. That may not be enough to sway scholars to think that that's the original number of the beast. In fact, I'd say most scholars today would still say 
The number of the beast, that's 666. 616, well, that's, that's the neighbor of the beast. He lives a few doors down, you know. <laughs> But I'll tell you this much. I'd say this is a meaningful variant. It's a viable variant. And I don't know what the original wording is. I've gone back and forth. Thought, oh, I think it's 616. And then read some other arguments and think it's 666. But as the senior New Testament editor and the textual critic for the Net Bible, if I put in the next edition of the Net Bible, Revelation 13, 18, the number of the beast is 616, that's going to send about seven tons of popular Christian literature to the flames. It'd be so fun to do. <laughs> but I can't do it for that reason, you know. It's just, oh, you really want to sometimes, though. But uh, I know of no theological institute, no seminary, no Bible college, no denomination, no church, no branch of Christendom except for the loonies who say in their doctrinal statement, we believe in the virgin birth, we believe in the deity of Christ, we believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ, and we believe that the number of the beast is 666. <laughs> it may be important, but it's not that important. So how important are these changes? What theological beliefs depend on textually suspect passages? So we come back to the Da Vinci Code, and, uh, code, and when uh, Sir Lee Teabing says to Sophie about a particular time in history, he declares this, and this is something that I understand Dan Brown actually believed because he's basing it on a, a British work where these uh, people actually believe this. So Teabing says, my dear, until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by, by his followers as a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man, nonetheless, a mortal. That moment was the year A.D. 325 when the Council of Nicaea met to define the deity of Christ. Now, it didn't make up the deity of Christ, as Dan Brown seems to suggest, or he seems to suggest actually that Emperor Constantine, the first so-called Christian emperor, actually invented the deity of Christ. Because at one point in his book he says the vote over this, over the deity of Christ, it was actually relatively close. Normally, I would think 318 to 2 would not be normally considered relatively close. And what it was was not even on whether Jesus was God or not, but how we're going to define the deity of Christ in A.D. 325. And so uh, here Dan Brown is suggesting that Constantine uh, basically invented the deity of Christ. Well, remember I told you an ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption? Uh, presumption? Let's take a look at another ounce of evidence. This is papyrus number 66, P66, dated about 175. And this is the very first leaf of John's Gospel. It has most of John in it, discovered in the 1950s. And, uh, of course, John 1.1 1, 1 is a verse you all know, at least if you're a Christian, you probably should know it. And because this is written about 150 years before the Council of Nicaea, it's going to say something entirely different. I'm going to shock you about this, but just be prepared for it. Because you know John 1.1 1, 1 says in your Bible, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, read along with me if you would. In, uh, <laughs> in verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Oh, I think we've heard that before. Maybe Constantine didn't invent the deity of Christ after all. Maybe it goes all the way back to the original New Testament. An ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption. Every single manuscript of John's Gospel, no matter the date or the language, says virtually the same thing in John 1. Way at one. Jesus is unequivocally called God. The same can be said for the major passages that affirm Christ's deity, his virgin birth, his sinlessness, his death on a cross, his bodily resurrection, and his second coming. We don't have textual variants that are going to disrupt these passages so that we're not sure if that's what the New Testament originally taught. But don't take just my word for it. Take Bart Ehrman's. He was asked, in misquoting Jesus, in the paperback version that came out, oh, six, seven months after the hard copy, why do you believe these core tenets of Christian orthodoxy to be in jeopardy based on the scribal errors you discovered in the biblical manuscripts? This was asked by the editors of this book. In other words, we know you believe that the core tenets of Christian orthodoxy are in jeopardy because of the variants. So why do you believe this? Just summarize the book for us. Here's what Ehrman wrote. Essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. 
You know, I put this up every time I've debated him, towards the end of my lecture. If I put it up at the very beginning, then everybody would go home and say, well, that wasn't, didn't take much time, it was a waste of $15. But, um, <laughs> but he can't dispute this. He wrote it. He knows that's the case. No essential doctrines are jeopardized by any of these textual variants. Even the strongest critic of the text of the New Testament today, Bart Ehrman, would say that. So let me conclude with this unnatural segue number two, and then we'll have time for, I guess, Q&A right after this. A polar bear attacks a man in Canada, and bystanders do nothing. The media didn't even report this incident. Now, I want you all to take about 10 seconds and visualize what this must have looked like. As I have photographs. If you have children here, you might want to cover their eyes. <laughs> Polar bear attacks a man in Canada. 400,000 texture variants. Less than 1% affect anything. This is the polar bear. It may have wrecked his 501 blues, you know, but, um, but that's about it. The New Testament, in all its essential teachings, is absolutely rock solid. Sure, there are places where we don't know what the original text says, and I think there may be as many as a thousand, although Bart Ehrman and I would probably disagree on only about 50 places. And yet, they don't affect any cardinal doctrines. They may affect some minor things but not any of the essentials of the Christian faith. And that I think you can take to the bank. Thank you very much. I think I stole from your bottle, it is more. I am so geeked up right now, that's ridiculous. <laughs> All right, um, a couple questions. Um, and I don't know if, if you wanna kind of address um, I'll start with the first one. You'll start with this word. Any update on the first century Mark fragment? In my last debate with Bart Ehrman, I dropped a bombshell that uh, there was a uh, first century fragment of Mark's gospel. And I, I mentioned that because in our second debate, he said the earliest manuscripts we have of Mark come from the third century. And uh, so I decided I'd, I'd mention this, but. It, there's some background to it that I really can't tell you about, and I know that people who have been following my blogs and things want to know, when is this thing going to get published? What part of Mark is it of? Uh, who dated it to the first century? How much text does it have? All those questions. And since that time, I have signed a non-disclosure agreement, and so I can tell you nothing. I can't even affirm that this thing exists. All I can say is you can use your own imagination that if someone find, uh, signs a non-disclosure agreement, they don't normally do it over a phantom. So that's how I have to leave that. I'm sorry, I wish I could tell you more, but that's all I can say. Um, this other question, how do we know that the words we now understand to be Jesus' is foretelling his own death and resurrection were not added afterward? That is a great question. Most people are gonna date the Gospels after AD 70 and so Jesus' uh, prediction about his own death and resurrection, his prediction about the fall of Jerusalem uh, that occurred finally in, in 70. Uh, some would say, uh, well, this was just words put on Jesus' lips after the fact. But the problem with that, there's actually many problems with that viewpoint. One is, uh, as J.A.T. Robinson pointed out, he was a, a British uh, New Testament scholar. In 1976, he argued that uh, in the Olivet Discourse, that's the, the passage about the prediction about the future things, about Jesus' return, about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, all this. What Jesus said did not come about in exactly the same way. And his point, which was a very interesting point, that he, he was driven by the evidence to this conclusion, was what Christian, after the fact, is going to leave those words intact if it's not exactly what happened, not just exactly the way they, wouldn't they change the words so it would conform to what history actually was? And the very fact that they didn't uh, meets what's known as a criterion of embarrassment. This is a very important criterion that historians use uh, to see if something actually was said or done. The criterion of embarrassment is one of these criteria of authenticity that New Testament scholars use to uh, determine whether Jesus said something. So if you have your red letter edition, 
Uh, scholars would say, well, some of this is red, some of it is pink, maybe the thoughts go back to Jesus, but not necessarily the words. Others would say it's gray, maybe none of it goes back, and some say it's black, none of it goes back at all. Well, let me give you uh, a, a couple examples of the criterion of embarrassment, just one criterion. When Jesus was baptized by John, in Mark's gospel, he gets baptized by John, but John, in Mark 1.5, is baptizing people for the forgiveness of sins. Then he baptizes Jesus, and you go, well, what's the reader supposed to make of this? Does that mean Jesus is a sinner? Is that what Mark is telling us? In Matthew's gospel, he actually has a conversation between John the Baptist and Jesus. And John protests, no, I shouldn't baptize you, you should baptize me. Jesus said, no, let's do this to fulfill all righteousness. So Mark's gospel, Mark's telling of it, fits the criterion of embarrassment. There is no way on earth that the church would invent John baptizing Jesus because John baptized sinners for repentance. And so the very fact that it's in our New Testament must mean it surely happened. In fact, I don't know any scholar uh, of any stripe who thinks that John did not baptize Jesus, except those who think that Jesus never existed, but they're, they're different. Um, so on the resurrection, what's really interesting here is the Gospels tell us that the first witnesses of the resurrection are women. Now, in the Jewish court of law in the first century, women's voice was nil. It, it didn't have any authority whatsoever. And there's plenty of references of that in Josephus and other uh, uh, rabbinic materials as well that I've, I've researched. Uh, many people have seen this. If you're going to invent the resurrection and you want to promote this as something that actually happened, would you have the first witnesses be women? Are you kidding me? You'd get some of the, the best guys who have great credibility, but not women who have, in that society, no credibility. So that fits the criterion of embarrassment. It's one of those things that, there's, there's lots of things like this. Uh, when Jesus says, again in the Olivet Discourse, that this generation will not pass away until all these things happen. Well, wait a minute, that generation did pass away. Is the early church going to invent that, knowing that it didn't quite work out that way? Maybe we need to interpret that differently, but the fact is that what the church preserves are things that are difficult for them to accept but they are faithful to the traditions about Jesus, and that's why uh, I have a great deal of confidence that yeah, what they're telling us is, in all essential respects, true. Okay, this goes back to some of the work with uh, CSNTM. Have you photographed manuscripts in non-visible wavelengths to look for mistakes or changes? We have uh, done some uh, ultraviolet uh, photography, and we haven't done infrared yet. Uh, I didn't see that question before, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that, that one just came in. Yeah. Um, there is uh, multispectral imaging photography that is really uh, some pretty amazing stuff. It was uh, first developed for NASA to <coughs> see camouflage military installations from outer space. And then it was developed at uh, Caltech by uh, a Jewish man working on some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he was able to uh, examine uh, so the, what's known as the Genesis Apocryphon that was just a blackened scroll. We could hardly make anything out of it. He was able to read two, 200 words with regular photography, but there were just, there were texts there, but it was just black, we couldn't make anything out. He used multispectral imaging, or MSI, and was able to read another 300 words. Now, it's just opening up all sorts of things. This is how the Herculaneum papyri out of uh, um, uh, Pompeii have been examined using multispectral imaging. It's enormously expensive. It costs about $1,000 to get one good image of a page. Uh, so uh, yes, it has been used, and more and more on different things. There's new technologies that are developing, and we have found a number of things using just ultra, uh, ultraviolet, uh, some text that could not be seen with the naked eye. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, let's see. Um, I, I guess we can if I understand this question correctly, after all the known and translated manuscripts, what is considered the most scripturally sound and accurate of the available versions and revisions today? Well, all of the translators who worked on those translations would say theirs is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it, it, it depends what you're getting, but let me, um, let me put it this way. Virtually all of our modern translations use almost an identical Greek text for the New Testament and almost an identical Hebrew text for the Old Testament. The only one that I know of that really is quite different from that is the New King James, 
which is a translation of the same Greek texts that were behind the King James, which differs from uh, our uh, modern critically reconstructed texts in about 5,000 places, the vast majority of which can't even be translated, but that's what it's translating. So th there's probably not 20 differences in the, in the wording of most modern translations in terms of the Greek text that they're translating. So then you say, well, what are the differences in it? Part of it is translation philosophy. Uh, some translate where they're trying to communicate uh, what's called a formal equivalence. If there's 16 words in the Greek, we want to have 16 words in the English. We want to have a, a matching, a word matching kind of a thing. The problem with that is formal equivalence is great if you have two languages that come from the same language base and there aren't any differences like Greek word order can be completely different from English. Um, but formal equivalence, that when somebody asks for, I want the most literal translation possible, I want the most faithful translation possible, I want the most word-for-word -word translation possible, I'll say, which of those three do you really want? Because they're not the same thing. The most literal word-for-word -word translation out there is the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses, except in the places where it disagrees with their basic theology. <laughs> and then it's the most paraphrastic. I mean, really, it's, it's, it's uh, if, if you want a really literal translation, get Wycliffe's from 1384. It was not even English, it was so bad. It was just translating the Latin, but that, that doesn't, a, a translation has to look at these things in terms of the faithfulness of the meaning. For example, Hebrew speaks about God getting angry and what it says is his nostrils enlarged. I haven't seen that in any English translation. It's very picturesque, you know what it means, you know. But, uh, or, or in uh, Matthew 1, when it's, uh, in the Greek, when it speaks about Mary being pregnant, it says in Greek, she was having it in the belly. All of you women who have been pregnant know what that means. <laughs> Man, I am having it in the belly, this is just ridiculous. And uh, so, but n we don't translate it that way. You know, King James, she was heavy with child. Heavy is not in there, child is not in there, but belly is. But they're translating the sense of it. The best kind of translation, I think, is one that is trying to be faithful to the original meaning. And if, if you have to interpret, then, and, and you always have to interpret in translation at some point, then you have to interpret. Other times you don't, but sometimes the King James even, it punts instead of, trans, instead of really interpreting where it has to trans, uh, interpret. In uh, Romans 3, for example, it says in Romans 3.22 um, that we are uh, saved by uh, faith of Christ. When some translations most have faith, faith in Christ, and the Net Bible has the faithfulness of Christ. And the King James didn't know if it was going to be faith in or the faithfulness of, so they kept it as faith of, which doesn't mean anything. Or in 1 Corinthians 7, it, it talks about either a virgin daughter or a virgin wife. You can't just leave it as, uh, keep your virgin at home and you, you've done well. It means one of those two things, and it depends if it's a Greco-Roman background or a Jewish background. All translations have to interpret, or else it means nothing to the, the English reader. So all translation involves interpretation. And uh, I'd say, frankly, most translations are pretty decent. I think you're going to get the essential message of the Bible in any translation. And I tested that theory by sharing the gospel over the years with Jehovah's Witnesses using their own New World Translation and seeing one or two of them come to Christ. Where I show them from their Bible, even Jesus is, is considered deity in your translation. As much as you guys tried to weed it out, it can't be done. Yeah. Uh, this next question actually goes to that because um, this question is, about the author's intended meaning to the original recipients. What skills must a reader develop and diligently use to best discover all details of the New Testament author's true intended meaning to the original recipients? This is known as exegesis, <clears throat> developing the skills to really understand as, as much as you possibly can what the original text meant, what the author meant. Exegesis and understanding that original author's intention involves trying to get into the, their world as much as you possibly can. Now, ideally what that means is learn the language. Learn Hebrew, learn Greek, learn Aramaic for those portions of the Old Testament that are in Aramaic. Uh, understand the Greco-Roman culture, understand the Jewish culture, understand the literature that was uh, around in that time. There's so many bridges we have to cross to just immerse ourselves in the ancient world to understand it better. And there are some scholars who are really well immersed in uh, Jewish backgrounds for the New Testament, and others in Greco-Roman backgrounds. There's, 
Uh, one scholar who did a two-volume commentary on John's Gospel where he's got 30,000 citations of ancient literature, most of it Jewish, showing the parallels. And he's done a phenomenal job. Uh, but when it comes to Greek grammar and textual problems, he almost doesn't touch those. That's not his forte. One of the things I think that is, is needed today to understand the text as well as we can is understanding that we are learning in community, just like you're doing here. I mean, what this church is doing is awesome. Yeah. I really thank you for doing this, Kevin. It's just Thank it's you great. for coming. Yeah, thanks. Um, it, we, we, we can't do this in isolation anymore. We need to be learning in community. And that means that each Christian needs to be reading some literature, some good commentaries, that, where various scholars have done this kind of work. But don't just settle on one and say, you know, F.F. F. Bruce, whatever he says, that's just what the Bible says. That's kind of a King James mentality. We don't want to have that. But, uh, Except like the Net Bible, whatever the Net Bible <laughs> says. No, we made mistakes here too. So. Um, Okay, I, I think we have time for maybe one or two more. This is actually one that I'm kind of curious of. What are your thoughts on the Old Testament and the Apocrypha? And I would probably add the Septuagint in there. Um, is there any commentary that you can give us regarding how that was transmitted over time in comparison to the New Testament? Are there any parallels? Or so is that what the question is asking about the transmission of those? Well, it just says, what are your thoughts on the Old Testament and the Apocrypha? I, I like the Old Testament. You, you can say you like it or not like it, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's ambiguous enough you can go wherever you'd like with that. Um, I, I know for me, I think the question is, I mean, I've, I've, the, the presentation on the New Testament transmission um, is fantastic. What, what parallels are there with the Old Testament or the Apocrypha or mm -hmm. even the Septuagint? Well, we, we don't have nearly as good textual evidence for the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Old Testament as we do for the uh, New Testament or the Hebrew Old Testament. Although uh, we do have some early Septuagint manuscripts, uh, you know, Greek manuscripts, uh, that uh, some of which we just photographed in, in uh, Dublin, in fact, uh, from the second century A.D. Uh, I, I discovered a fragment uh, a year ago at a, at, a, at a group where we were looking at some papyri of a first century fragment of Isaiah 65. I mean, just, uh, so there's, first. the stuff is first century, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, A.D., not B.C., <coughs> but um, still, that's awfully early. I think yeah. it's the oldest fragment of it. Oh. Um, when it comes to the Hebrew Bible, there is a, a kind of a, a legend that has sprung up about the copying of the Hebrew Bible. And it, it has two prongs to it. One is people will look at the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in the late 1940s and then it took decades to get these published. The Dead Sea Scrolls found in the uh, Qumran area of the Dead Sea in, in several different caves, um, most of them in Hebrew. They have uh, most of the books of the Old Testament uh, among these scrolls and they've got uh, uh, Isaiah, which is a really well-preserved scroll. Uh, all this is written no later than about A.D. 68 when uh, that uh, community was overrun by the Romans. So much of it, if not most of it, is first century B.C. material. And scholars have looked at that Isaiah scroll and they've compared it to the standard Hebrew Bible that is standing behind all modern translations, which is written in the 9th or 10th century. It's, it, there's one of two manuscripts, I won't get into the details, Leningrad and Aleppo, but anyway, uh, I'm sure um, Danielle can wax eloquent about that. Where's Danielle? Oh, there you are. So, so she can do damage control next week after I'm done. <laughs> this week. Say, okay, he was wrong on this and wrong on this. The guy should stick to the New Testament. He just done it. And, and that really is largely true. But nevertheless, um, I'll say what I can say, and you can fix this later. So uh, there are people who will say, well, you see the Isaiah scroll? It changes almost not at all in those 900 years. This shows that these scribes were extraordinarily careful and, and that they just didn't uh, make changes to the text. Well, you can say that about the Isaiah scroll, but when it comes to the Jeremiah scroll or the First Samuel scroll or the Judges scroll, you can't say those things. They, they are quite different. And uh, so the second part of this legend is that the Hebrew scribes over the centuries, what they would do is they would write out their text and if any of the letters touched, then they'd throw the manuscript away, and uh, they'd count the letters, and it'd have to be a certain uh, number on each page, and um, they'd always have to take a bath before they uh, wrote uh, the divine name, and uh, they'd also uh, uh, have to get a new pen if they wrote uh, Elohim, uh, or uh, the word God. Um, and there's some possibility that that's what they did at certain points, mostly in the medieval times, but we just don't know what the kind of scribal habits were 
in the ancient times. And there's some possibility that even in medieval times, what they actually did was when it came time to writing out the divine name, they'd, they'd leave a blank in the text for many pages, go take a bath, get a new pen, and fill it all in. And that's why we have discrepancies in our Hebrew manuscripts between Lord and God in places. But we know it's Lord God, it's never going to be uh, Joseph or something like that. So <laughs> same, same reference. So I, I'd say we need to be really careful about what we're saying. And the one thing that I decided years ago is I don't want to um, uh, doctor things up for evangelicals for them to hear what they want to hear. We, we need to face the facts. And the facts are some of the stuff for the Old Testament is still difficult to tell. The uh, New Testament is in so much better shape than the Old Testament. But um, the medieval scribes were careful. I just can't say that goes back to the earliest times. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two, and I apologize, I, I'm, we're not able to get to every question. We'll do our best to maybe have this available online afterwards. Um, how accurate is the dating of the manuscripts, and what really is the process of dating? Is it carbon dating, but I think there's uh, handwriting analysis as well, yeah. so what's the, what's the process there and the accuracy? Carbon dating is, is recently developed for manuscripts because it always would destroy a certain part of the text, and they didn't like doing that, of course. Um, there's kind of a non-destruct carbon 14 dating that's used sometimes, but very, very rarely on manuscripts. They, I think uh, uh, biblical scholars still haven't discovered this. The, the standard way in which manuscripts are dated is uh, through uh, handwriting analysis. And you say, well, that, that sounds like it's really subjective. And that's why we can't say this was written in the year AD 129 in September. Uh, we usually can give a 50 to 100 year period of the gap for at least Greek manuscripts. And the reason uh, we can do that is because the way certain letters were drawn over the centuries changed. And in fact, they changed more rapidly in the early centuries. And by the time we get to the 10th century to the 13th, the changes really slow down. So it's really hard to date a manuscript from the 10th, 11th, 12th, or 13th, which of those centuries does it belong to? The earlier centuries, we can get it within 50 years, typically. The later centuries, within a century. And so let's say the, the way an alpha was written uh, was one way for about a 150-year period. And then a beta would be written, written uh, one way for a 150-year period. But those two 150-year periods are not exactly the same. They might overlap by 75 years. And you do this through the whole alphabet. And then there's a thing known as ligatures, where you have letter combinations. And you find those letter combinations, like uh, in uh, archaeology, in the British spelling, where they had the A and the E, and they had the same uh, vertical bar that uh, used to touch back in the uh, 50s and 60s. Um, that kind of spelling, if you saw something in a book today, you'd say, oh, that's an older spelling, and it's a British spelling. You recognize it even in printed texts. If you saw the Constitution or Declaration of Independence, one thing you'd know for sure is this wasn't written in the 21st or the 20th century. It was old. And you, you know, we're, we're not good at paleography typically, but we can at least recognize this is older than this, something like that. And so by using these techniques and comparing these letters and ligatures and all sorts of things, we can, we can get a good sense. There's, there's some clear demarcations, too. For example, uh, all the manuscripts written uh, up through the 10th century were written, uh, the letters were written on top of a line. And then from the 10th or from the 11th on, they were hanging from the line. And so if you can actually see in the photographs whether there's a line that was, uh, it, it's, it's uh, scrolled, it's all in, it's not ink, but it's an indentation. And if it's sitting on the line or hanging from, that helps you to date the manuscript. So there's, there's little things like that. This is first millennium, oh, this is first century, we can do this. And, mm -hmm. and um, I think we can get pretty darn close. Most of the stuff that has been done in paleography gets very close. Sometimes there's a debate about, it. well, this could be this century or this century, and that really, that's why we have a job, because we like to debate those little issues, you know. <laughs> All right, last question. I think this goes to uh, a little bit of the Bibles that we carry around with us today. Uh, the question is, how does culture and context affect the translation and understanding of the text that we have today? So we carry this around with us. We have thousands of years of culture and context that have brought these translations. Your comments on, I, I, I think you mentioned it, or you alluded to it earlier before, but what, what can we think about, right. you know, the NIV that we were holding, the NS, you know, all those different translations that we have? We all come with uh, a, a group of experiences and cultures and things like this, communities we come out of, that's unique. You know, nobody's uh, experience is exactly the same as somebody else's, but we're still 20th century human beings. 
uh, or 21st, did I say 20, 21st century now? So, um, And one of the things that, that students in seminary are trained about, for at least for New Testament studies, is to know the first century world like the back of their hands. And one of the things that we try to encourage them with is, now that you know the first century world, don't forget the 21st century world. You live in that one too. And I tell my students you have to have one foot firmly planted in each world. And as a, a, a former pastor of mine said one time, it takes the average seminary graduate five years to thaw out from the experience. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they still need to get reconnected with the real world that they're in today. But most Christians don't have a clue about what that first century world or earlier world for the Old Testament text really was like. And uh, I think that's uh, very important for all of us to try to get some things. There's typically a thing known as a Bible handbook that can help you. Normally, nowadays, the, the first source you want to look at is, well, I could do this for free on the internet. I don't need to go buy a book. And what you're seeing for free is something that's not refereed, and uh, you don't know who the person is. You don't know if it's reliable information. And usually, it, it, it's the looniest views that you get the most hits on on the internet. They're just, just remarkable. So if you see my mind getting a lot of hits, then <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, some books are worth buying, I think, even in a codex, not just a scroll. So. <laughs> well, some of those books we're going to give away. Would you please uh, thank Dr. Wallace for coming in and sharing? Thanks, Thank you.